Okay, so here we're going to look at doing shear and moment diagrams with SOLIDWORKS simulation. So we're going to do it all by hand and be like, yay, we're going to do it on the computer and get the exact same answer. So that's what we're going to do here. First of all, we're going to draw the beam off by itself and create a free body diagram. So we have this nice little distributed load on a beam, seven meters long or whatever. So we start drawing it up. Now we see on the left that we have like a little pin connection thingy so we can put in our two reaction forces. We have like a whatever you want to call it, AX and AY or whatever, something like that, yay. And on the other side, you've got like a roller kind of connection and we'll just call that guy BY. Okay, we're doing all this because we want to get the reaction forces. Now what we can do is we can take this rectangle here and we can find the area of it so that we can reduce it to a single force just so we can get these external um, loads. So we know that it's 200 times 4 is going to give us an area of 800 because we're really good at geometry right now. So basically we have an 800 newton force at the center of the rectangle which is located at 2 meters. So we can put in the 800 over here and it's at 2 meters and that's 8. Fantastic! Alright, now we're going to find the area of a triangle and we're also really really good at that because we know that it is going to be like 3 meters and then 200 newtons per meter, except that the area of a triangle is half that. So it's one half base times height, which basically means that we have a 300 newton force. And we know that the centroid of a triangle is one third from the fat side. And so that means that it's going to be one third from there. And so it's one. And basically now we can put four plus one is five and put in the five with the 300 newton force. And we've simplified this for the purposes of finding those reaction forces. And this is, you know, simply whatever, because, you know, we've already been at this for two minutes and haven't really done much of anything except this. But that's okay, because it's exciting. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to find the sum of the moments about A. All right. So we've got negative 2 times 800, negative 5 times 300, and then BY times uh, 4 plus 3 is 7. And that's going to have to equal 0. And that means that by is going to be equal to 443. So that's that reaction force, and we're good to go. We'll do the easy one next, which is the sum of the forces in the x direction, which is ax equals 0, which means that there's no normal going on, which is like, yeah, duh. And then we've got the sum of the forces in the y direction. So we have a y um, minus uh, 800 minus 300 plus that 443, which is by. That equals zero, and that tells us that AY is equal to 657. Yay! All right, so we're good there. Okay, now all this is lovely, and this is great, but this is actually not going to, well, it is going to help us do our shear and moment diagram thingies. But now that we've got these lovely 800s and 300s, we're actually going to discard them because we don't want them anymore. So, well, you know, for the purposes of what we're doing. Oh, this isn't moving. All right, come on. Do, 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 do. Oh, no, I missed the A. She'll get over it. All right. So out of the way, take a break, watch me play around with my little computer thingy, and I'm just going to call it now. We're good to go. Okay. So now we want to get started on this, um, whatever you call it, shear diagram thingy. So um, what we want to do is we see that, okay, we start off and we can go ahead and put that 443 and that 657 in there. Um, so that we can refer to them as we're des designing, des designing, we're not really designing, we're uh, sketching our shear diagram. Um, so we know that it starts at the 657, so that initial reaction is 657, so we can go ahead and get this started. And this isn't letting me draw it really pretty, so let me do this again. All right, so basically right here at the start, we know we're starting immediately off with a shear of 657 because we're most likely to shear right at the at the connector, and that makes you know sense and stuff. So um, we're going to put that in there, and we know that here is there going, there's going to be some kind of an inflection point as we go from the flat um, distributed load to the triangular distributed load. All right, so we start at the 657, and now we're going to see what we need to do to draw the rest of this shear diagram in. Got it? Okay. So essentially what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the area that we have on this um, triangle thing. So we have 657 minus the area is 800, which leaves us with 100 or negative 143, which means that we've lost the area. So we start off with 657, but as we go down the beam, we lose an area of 140, or we lose an area of 800, which ends up down at 143. 
Okay, so um, since that's a constant, whenever we take the derivative of a constant, we get a slope line, or not the derivative of a constant, derivative of a zero, we get a slopey line. I'm not going to worry about that intersection yet, but then we're going to go ahead and take a look at the triangle. And we know that the triangle has a um, area of, whatever you call that, 300. So we're going to lose another 300 of the area, so we are all the way down to negative 443. So we can put that down, down to negative 443, and we can at least plot that point in there for the moment. And that's good because it's going to pop back up 443 back to zero, so that kind of, that's good. The next thing is to figure out how we're going to actually connect this line. And it's important to remember that even though on this beam it kind of looks like it's a downward facing triangle, it's really a positive slope, an upward facing triangle. And everybody knows that upward facing slopes make you like happy. So it's a, a happy face or, you know, just however you want to think about it. It's, it's taking the, the derivative of a, of a positive slope. So positive slopes always turn out to be smiley faces and stuff, parabolas or, well, what? yeah, parabolas because the integral of a line is a parabola. So that's what we're going to do is we're going to fill it in with a lovely parabola and come down here and do that. So it's got to be happy parabola. So do, 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 do. there we go. All right. So that's one way to think about it. So if the smiley face, frowny face stuff doesn't work for you, another way to think about it is like right here, we're only losing a little bit of area, whereas over here, we're losing a ton of area. So whenever you're looking at these two things, you can kind of make that same connection is that over here, we are losing a ton of area and then eventually we're only losing a little bit of area. And so that's kind of where that comes in. So that's another way to think about it. And like I said, we go up to 443 and so we're back to zero. So we've got a really, really nice um, little shear diagram and are just about to go ahead and get started on the moment. Oh, but before we do that, um, we really do need to figure out where this um, intersection point is because that's going to be a um, an extreme point whenever we're doing our moment diagram. And really the best way to do this is just basic um, algebra and because I'm kind of awesome at algebra, um, I'm going to go ahead and do that. So we know because we're super, super smart that the equation of a line is y equals mx plus b. And let's see, we know the slope because, okay, so y equals, the slope is that negative 200 because that's what we had and we labeled it as positive 200, but the arrows were pointing down. So we knew it was negative. It's also a negative slope if you actually look at the picture. So yay, negative slope. So um, our slope is y equals, um, it's over here, negative 200x plus the y-intercept, and the y-intercept is 657, so that's good. And then I want to know, okay, so where is that x point whenever y equals 0, and then I do math, 657, and then I get x equals, um, uh, where is it, 3.229, something like that, yeah. And that makes sense because it's less than 4, and we have an answer. Yay! So that's where we expect something interesting to happen whenever we make our moment diagram. Okay, there we go. So as we are doing our moment diagrams, the only, only, if there is an only thing that we have to remember is that the moment diagram is the integral of the shear diagram. So a lot of those fancy points that we had are good. We can use them and it's going to be lovely, lovely. So this, um, there were no initial moment reactions on the beam. So because it was a pin joint, so that means our moment diagram starts off at a zero. There's absolutely no risk of bending there because it'll move. It, it allows it to move, so there is no bending there. Now the next thing we want to do is we want to come up with the area of this triangle. And again, we are really, really good at this because we know that it is in fact one half times the base times the height of the triangle. So, and that was really good that we had that 3.29 because we knew that we were going to need it eventually. So we've got one half, 3.29 times 657 and we get something along the lines of uh, doo -doo 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 -doo, 1080. All right, so this is actually going to be our max bending on the beam because that's when the area is going to go from positive to negative. So we're going to accumulate 1080 worth of area and then we're going to lose area until we finally have no more area left. It's super, super sad. Okay, so there's that critical point there when something interesting is going to happen. Namely, we're going to start losing area Okay, and then we want to think about how we're going to connect these two lines. 
And again, we have a downy slope, and a downy slope is a, is a frowny face. And so we draw in our little frowny face, and we're good to go. Another way to think of it is we start off with getting a super duper lot of area, and, um, and then toward the end, we're only getting a little bit of area, so that's another way. So super duper and little bitty, um, and you have, just have to remember that it's additive, it's continuous. Okay, so where are we going next? All right, yeah, the next thing we wanna do is we wanna find the area of this little guy. And again, we're super happy that we have a 3.29, so the base of the triangle is four minus 3.29, and its height is 143. One half base times height, and that's going to give us um, a, a 51. All right. So, and this is a negative area though, because we've lost it, because we had we were making progress, obtaining all this area, and now we've started to lose area. So that means that we're going to get down here to 1028. Now, whenever we're at 1028, more interesting things are going to happen, but we'll get to that. Now, the important thing to think is this is actually a full continuous line because the line above it is continuous, so there's there's no change in like the behavior of this line. So it's a it's a parabola and it's a smooth parabola. So there's no kind of chunkiness going on right there. Okay, it's it's a very, very smooth line. Okay. Now we're gonna get to this last part, and quite frankly, I have no desire to try to calculate the um, area of the, the remaining section because it's a it's a weird um, parabola. Yeah, it's a weird parabola. I do know that it goes to zero because there's no um, moment at the end of the beam, which is fine. So there's a couple of ways as you can think about it is you can either say, okay, well, this is an x squared parabola and um, because it was the integral of a, of a line, the integral of a y equals mx plus b kind of thing is gonna give you a parabola, parabola, so that means if I integrate a parabola from there, I should get a cubic. And the question is, is it just like, is it going to be a frowny cubic or a happy cubic? And so we want to kind of take a look and see if we can kind of guess at it. Um, my initial thought is to go ahead and actually graph what an x squared looks like. So we have an x squared that would look like this. Do, 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 do. And then we have the cubic. If we took the cubic, it's going to look like it's going to look like this. I don't think this is going to help. I think that I'm probably going to be better off just thinking about it from the context of is it like a like a, a whole lot of area versus a little bit of area. So actually, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to look at it that way. Um, whenever I start out with the um, whenever I'm right there at that x equals four, I can see that I'm getting a lot of change in area and then eventually um, I mean not a lot of change in area I'm getting a little bit of a change in area right and then here I get a whole lot of a change of area and then here I'm gonna get a hold on I'm not there we go I'm getting a whole lot of change in area so again a little bit of area a little bit more area a little bit more area whole lot of area whole lot more of area whole lot more of area so the the most violent change at, occurs toward the end when you actually have the most area being added so this is probably not going to be exactly what it looks like when we do it on SOLIDWORKS, but it's at least something to get us started. Um, again, because this direction here is just seven and this direction here is like a thousand, so all of our scales just totally messed up. But the idea is just to get kind of like, okay, what is this going to look like generally? And so we have some, some critical points that we can go check in SOLIDWORKS and at least see if we're getting the right answer. So that's where we are going to go next. So now let's go in here and um, put together our parts. So we're going to create a new part. The part's going to be called part. And we'll draw it on the right plane. And um, even though the size of the beam doesn't really matter, I'm going to recommend not going too crazy with the sizes of it. Because if you get it too thick, then you might get some kind of distortion in the way that your picture looks. So I'm just going to point it at point, I don't know, 0.05 or something like that. Just a nice little 0.05 beam sketched there. And I made it a center, so it's perfectly defined. And now I am going to extrude it um, by seven. Yay, Alrighty, Good to go, lovely bean. That's all there is to making the part. So, um, so that's what you got from there. I'm gonna go ahead and save it. And I'll call it as, you know, a shear and bullet diagram. Beautiful, all right, so, 
I have my lovely part created, and this is exciting as it gets. Now I'm going to go into SolidWorks st simulation and create a study, a static study. It's going to be super awesome. All the cool kids are doing it. The next thing I want to do is I want to make sure that I treat it as a beam. Um, whenever I do that, the little joint group thingy is going to get mad at me, and I say, no, 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 it's cool. We got just, just do what you want to do, and I'm happy with it. So you click Calculate, and then you say, yay, and it's good to go, and it's happy. Okay. Now, we want to make sure that we put in some fixtures. So for the fixed geometry, we don't want to put a full fixed geometry on there um, because it does allow bending. So um, we don't have a we don't have a, a moment reaction there. Um, so I'm going to come and I'm going to explicitly tell it to use reference geometry. I'm going to click this one. I'm going to randomly pick a uh, reference face, and I'm just going to say, "Don't let it translate in any of the three directions." Now, um, technically, you could probably get away with not including one of these um, because you don't have any. Um, all, we're really looking at a two-dimensional system, but sometimes it gets mad at you if you don't, so I just try not to irritate SolidWorks if I can help it. Okay. Now, next thing we want to do is over here, I want to put in the other reaction force. So, reaction force is doo -doo -doo, fixed geometry. All right, reference geometry again, and dupe, and just randomly pick a side. And now this one's actually important, so um, I only want it to go up. That's not up. Is that up? That's not up. Is that up? I can't see. Maybe that's up and I just really can't see it. Let me make that arrow a little bit bigger. I like to make my arrows 300. Ah, there we go. It's not up. I'll reverse the direction. Oh, that didn't really do anything, did it? First direction? Do you not want to reverse your direction? It really doesn't matter because it's just zero, so it doesn't matter which direction zero is. I'll leave it. I'm cool. I, I can be cool. All right, so now I've got this lovely beam, and I'm going to make the other arrows bigger too just to make sure that I can see them. It'll make me feel better about myself. Like, look at this giant arrow. I am so good at this. Okay, and it's also upside down, but that's not a big deal. Okay, now I want to add a force. Okay, I want to make sure that I have beam selected. I'm going to click my beam. And now this is important, actually. I do want to say that I want it to be on the top. Okay. Now, under units, it's going to be per unit length. And we don't want to use any of this CRUD stuff. We want to use a non-uniform distribution. It's going to be table driven. And I don't know why it defaults percentage, because percentages are stupid. Um, so. Now we go do 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 do, and it's probably going to be backwards because anytime I do this, it's always backwards. Um, but basically, we're going to recreate what we had before. So I'm going to say, well, at zero, it's 200, and the tab button doesn't work because I don't know why. Because why make things easy? And then at four, it's still 200, and then I need a new row. Come here. Oh, of course. All right. Well, at four, it's 200. And then at um, 7, when I get all the way at 7, it's going to go back to 0. And that doesn't look right. Oh, there we go. Well, yeah, it really doesn't look right. I'm going to flip the origin, so that's what I want. And um, and again, if you want to make the symbols a little bit bigger, you can. It doesn't matter how close to each other they are. It'll get, um, it'll get applied well. So you're good. Good to go. Yay. Okay. Now... I'm going to go ahead and apply my favorite material, plain carbon steel, and I want to, um, let me just go ahead and run it and see what happens. Okay, so here we go. Okay, now if I want to, I can see the um, resultant forces. So I can say, well, what is the reaction force here? And there's the 657, which I expected to get, and the zero in the other direction, and Yay, okay, that's excellent. Um, the reaction force here should be 443. Goody, it's always nice to be right. Okay, so I do have the correct correct reaction forces, so that's good. All right, now I want to actually see, take off the deformed result, actually want to see what that beam diagram is. Actually, that's kind of cool because it should be the bendiest right at 3.49. Oh, look, I just realized that, you know, all this math means something. Okay, so here at 3.49, you can actually see that's where the most bendiness happened. Now, it's not a lot of bendiness. It's like, well, actually, that looks like a lot of bendiness. That's because my, my beam is really skinny. That is a lot of bendiness. But anyway, the max bendiness occurred right here. And in fact, that's going to look 
pretty much like our moment diagram except flipped upside down. Great. Okay, so I want to go ahead and I want to see the beam diagram. Now, um, I always get these forces mixed up, so I just pick one and then see if it's right and select all. And um, it doesn't look like it did anything. Um, but if you, there we go. If you go like this, you'll, you'll see stuff. Come here. So that doesn't look very good. I don't like that guy. Let's try a different one. Uh, two. Ah, there we go. That looks right. So basically, it was just getting the axis correct. Okay, so here we go. Now, if we compare this to what we had before, that is precisely what we had before, which is funny because whenever I did this earlier, um, it was upside down, although the numbers were still right. So basically, it started red and then went up to blue. And I have no idea why um, SolidWorks does it, but that doesn't really matter because I'm looking at the actual values. So the actual values were 657 up here and then right around here, that probably that point that we care about. Um, it crosses over to zero and then I get to here and then it goes like that. Now, if you go in here and you probe for more information, you can say, give me the probe on this guy, update, and here are a ton of parameters. Now, notice that this is very annoying <laughs> because here it actually says that 657 is happening at one. And what that means is like, I guess measuring from here to here at 100% is at 657 because here at zero is that negative 443. Okay, so it's a little bit weird trying to pull this out, but you do see the max is 657, the min is um, 442. Um, and I think that I should be able to click on certain parts, maybe. You're gonna let me do that? You're gonna let me mess with you at all? Maybe, maybe not. Um, I should be able to have him tell me useful information. No, of course not. Oh, there we go. So there we go. I can tell it if I go into chart options, I can say, tell me max and min. And it used to let me print maybe because it's giving me a good chart. Now it's not letting me click on anything. Um, that's not what I wanted. Do 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 probe. Uh, this guy update. Yeah, maybe not. That's okay. Um, Look how lovely that looks. That looks really great. Um, if you want to play around with this, you can actually, um, again, this, this chart is, is, is weird because it's using that 100% thing. So um, really it's giving this to you backwards, which I really don't understand why. I'm sure there's like some fancy reason, but essentially what I'm going to do now is I'm going to save this and I'm going to go put it in Excel and I'm going to make something that makes sense now. So now I've got this open in Excel. And here's this parametric distance, and really I don't want that. I know that this is actually, so the this is the, the 100, this is really the 100% end if I'm thinking about measuring from left to right. So I'm going to 1 minus that times 7 because that's the length of my beam. And I'm just going to double click that so it goes all the way down. And now if I want copy, paste, value, that way I can just delete the stupid line. And I'll delete this stupid line because I don't really care. Um, shear. I'm going to sort. There we go. Oh, and these are backwards. There we go. Now I know what I'm doing. Okay. Now if I plug this in, I should get a pretty picture. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> All right. So there's the length, and that is exactly what I had drawn up. And you could say, okay, well, where is that zero point going to be? Um, I can just look and see. Wow, that's a lot of data. Do -do -do, do -do 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 -do. And it's big. And there we go. So here's where I go from positive to negative, and it's right there at 3.29. Okay. You may say, well, why does it jump from 3.22 to 3.29? And that's just because of the size of the mesh. We could actually change that and get more granularity or less granularity, I don't know, make it more grainy, that doesn't seem right. We can get more detailed if we want, um, but right there at that 3.29 is where it goes from, um, from positive to negative. So that's pretty cool. Now we can come over here and get out of this, now that we have actually useful information, and I'm going to create the other beam diagram. Okay, so my other beam diagram is going to be a moment, and I don't know which one it'll be, I'll just pick one. 
and um, there she is. Okay, so she's actually kind of weird. So um, there we go. So there's the beam diagram. And you might say, well, that just looks like a pure parabola. And yeah, it kind of does, but it actually isn't. I don't know if you can tell by looking at it. No, not really. It's going to be really hard to see. So let's go ahead and um, put in some settings. We want to go ahead and show our max and min. And there we go. We get that the min is that um, 1080 value. Max, where are you? Why are you labeling that over there? That doesn't make any sense. Oh, that it's just upside down. It's giving us the opposite direction. So it's giving us um, super duper negative uh, moment reactions. And that's just probably because SolidWorks is defining its, um, um, what do you call it? Conventions, just the opposite of how we're doing it. So it's actually giving us purely, purely 100% the opposite of what we're looking for. So they're not calling it a max, they're calling it a min. But it is that 1080 value and if you look it's not actually dead center because dead center would be like right here so it's not a beautiful perfect parabola it is in fact that um curvy beautiful parabola followed by a slightly more bowed out cubic so if you try it's really kind of hard to point out but if you look right here for example you'll see that this is a little bit i want to say thicker like this this blue color lasts longer here than it does here. That light blue color doesn't last as long here as it does here, and that's because this curve is slightly more um, bowed out. Okay, but again, don't take my word for it. Let's go ahead and look at the actual data. So I'm going to go pull this up, and I'm going to ignore this totally useless information, and I will come over here. Oh, down here. And I'm going to pull off the data. And now that I know a little bit more about what I'm doing, I'm going to do the same thing. 1 minus that times, ah, times, come on, times 7. So this will give me my actual distance. And I'm going to go ahead and copy and paste that as values. That way I can delete this line without any concern whatsoever. So this is actually, instead of calling it, this is going to be my um, look. And this will be my moment. So I'm going to go ahead and sort it just so that it looks better. And now I can go ahead and insert a scatter plot. And there is my, except it's all backwards, so I can even fix that so that I like it better. So this is equal to the negative of that. And paste as value. And, do -do -do, and insert the scatter plot again. There we go. So there's the moment. And I think this is a little bit more obvious. That when you look at it um, it's not a perfect parabola that it does in fact arc out this way so we know that at 3.29 um, is where we should see that 1080 and if we don't want to look at it here um, you know we can find the 3.29 eventually so there's the 3.29 and that's where the 1080 happens and we also had the 1028 over at the 4 so if I come down to 4 there's that 10, oh, don't format it like this. Nobody likes scientific notation. 1028-ish, um, good enough, I like it. 1028, that's, that's beautiful considering we did it by hand. And, um, and there you got this really nice little moment diagram. If you don't like seeing all those points, um, you can edit it so this isn't like an Excel thing, but, um, oh, I just changed that one marker, that was funny. Um, you know, you can go in here and you can you can make it pretty and, and do all kinds of stuff. Um, and now you've got a nice little moment diagram. That looks funny still. But anyway, you've got a nice moment diagram that's a lot better than the one that um, SolidWorks defaults to. So I recommend doing that every time. But if nothing else, it, it certainly gets you going and, and allows you to verify that what you're doing by hand is really actually what's happening. And clearly, whenever you're doing this in the you know real world, whatever that means, um, you're not going to be doing these by hand. But it's important that you understand what's going on. So whenever um, SolidWorks come back and gives you all these negative numbers, you're like, that doesn't make any sense. And then you know to go ahead and change it and know what, you know, if you know what you're supposed to be looking for, then whenever you don't find it, you understand what you have to do to manipulate the data. So this is a really, really awesome thing to, to be able to do in SolidWorks.